Hi all, I want to jump in before we get started with the episode to give you content warnings. Those include, but are not limited to, discussions of abusive work environments, drug use and addiction, spousal abuse, eviction, and intellectual property theft. If this is the episode for you, please protect yourself. There will always be more. Thank you so much for listening and supporting us, and with that, let's get into the episode. Gamers, you're my little gamers. My name is Tease, and I like to Hello, and welcome to Author's Note. Don't like, don't listen. My name is Cass. And my name is Tease. Tease, what if one of these times I just got really NPR on the intro and I was like, Hello, welcome to Author's Note. Don't like, don't listen. My name is Cass. And my name is Tease. You know, I don't know how well Parks and Recreation has aged, but that was one of the bits that I did enjoy from it when they were making fun of NPR. And they were like, That's fair. we're now playing jazz for the next 12 hours. <laughs> I mean, that kind of is NPR. So. <laughs> What's her name? Terry. It's Block and Siegel, isn't it? But I can never remember what their first names are. No, I'm thinking of the one NPR reporter who's like iconic. Terry Gross. Tease, how are you doing today? Cass, I'm pretty good. Yeah? I'm, I'm sleepy, but I'm pretty good. <laughs> We're going to wake you up. Oh, God, okay. Have you partaken in the delights of media this week? Oh, my God. I went to my first concert since February 2020. How did it feel? Oh, my God, it felt so good. <laughs> it felt so good. I cried. I, I legitimately cried during it. I got so overwhelmed that I cried. Aww. It was, uh, I mean, for people who probably like, well, what was it, Tease? I saw Hopalog, who is a band that I have been a fan of for maybe like three, four years now. Mm -hmm. And this is my second time seeing them. And it was just such a really great experience. They did not play my favorite song by them, but they played my second favorite song from them and i cried like a little baby at the end of the song but that was really healing and then i'm going to a concert tomorrow Damn. <laughs> like <laughs> like a little idiot so there's that and then besides that i finally finished a book that i've been reading for the past three months so was it dune no <laughs> <laughs> Steers off to camera. <laughs> <laughs> I still have to finish Dune. <laughs> I've been reading Dune since March. <laughs> Fuck. It's October. Oh. Um, no, I finished Our Band Could Be Your Life by Michael Azarad, mm -hmm. and that was absolutely delightful. Oh, what fantastic. about you, Cass? Yeah. I can't think of what i watched this week really or no read no this squid week. game like everybody else oh yes i started watching squid game with there Jala, you go. and i've been having a really fun time with that i am again we're measuring it out over time because jala has a absolutely buck wild schedule um so she can't watch it super frequently so we just finished the last episode we finished was episode five but i'm enjoying oh. it i'm consistently impressed by the color grading of it yeah yeah i i cannot imagine trying to film those neon suits i like the iconography of it it's really fun the acting's really great and um as much as it has been stirring up drama on the internet between people talking about you know the different contexts with which you have to read the series it's actually been really informative about Korean culture in a mm. way that I'm finding really engaging and interesting. So you love to learn. That's exciting. Love that for you. I don't think you're you're ready to learn about this week, though. This is going to be a never meet your heroes episode, isn't it? hundred percent. Great. <laughs> so love it. this week we're doing our Patreon pick from a few months ago for Lisa Frank. Yay. <laughs> Tease, what do you know about Lisa Frank? 
Lisa Frank is a artist who rose to fame in the 90s for her colorful designs of dolphins and rabbits and cats and dogs and ice creams and pandas and mm. little bananas with sunglasses on. And <laughs> a lot of her stuff was on stationery. There's also later on there are T-shirts and binders and makeup collabs and all of the stuff. I know that Lisa Frank has been a cornerstone for 90s pop culture and in particular girl, young girl culture, yeah. I would yeah. say. And I know later on down the line, there were a few issues with Lisa Frank. Like I know the company basically like stole somebody's apartment design yeah we'll get to that <laughs> yeah yeah i mean but besides that lisa frank is an artist that looms in my mind mm -hmm. and honestly if i was a funny little cartoon if you were looking to my brain everything would kind of just be <laughs> lisa frank painting at this point <laughs> fast lisa frank print one like <laughs> i don't know well she doesn't really use the color black except for eyelashes, so Bass would probably end up being, like, purple or blue. And that would fucking rule! I'm sure you could find an artist who emulates the style to commission, though. Yeah, that would be fun. So, we're gonna take a little walk down memory lane. Tease and I are both millennials, and I want to tell you all the tale of back in my day when oh, school God. supply shopping started. Um, it was kind of something that, uh, came about with a bit of dread in late July to early September each summer. And I went to relatively well-funded schools, I would say, but there was still a really heavy reliance on students to procure their own supplies. And those back-to-school shopping trips really racked up quite quickly. Mm -hmm. So schools in my area would disseminate lists to local office supply chains, as well as superstores like Walmart and Target, or they would mail the list directly to students' homes of everything they would need. Very rarely did my school ever send a list home with us. I think they did it like once. Every other time, it was like you walked into Target or something. I didn't shop at Target as a child, but oh, how I desired. We went to Staples. And Staples would have just, like, a big wall of paper flyers that they had taped up for all the different grade levels of, like, what you needed to buy. So, for grades first through seven, that was probably the most intensive of the list shopping. And by the time I reached high school, I'd kind of figured out what I needed for myself to buy to work as, like, a student. But as a little baby... Uh, it was everything kind of by the list. So those lists would ask for folders in particular colors. They ask for an amount of pencils, pens, art supplies, specifically ruled paper. You know, how many pencils do you, you need in particular? Do you need uh, textbook covers? All that sort of stuff. Now, I was a terrible, boring child who always asked if I could use Times New Roman when my teachers told the class that we had to use Comic Sans. And uh, when it came to buying stationery as a child, I was incredibly boring and was like, I want dark and muted colors. And they're like, we need a red folder, a blue folder, and a yellow folder. And I'm like, can I just get all black ones? And my mom's like, no, they, no. <laughs> I'm like, please, I don't like them. <laughs> Here is where we differ vastly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, Lisa, Pre the Lisa Frank products were pretty much everything that I detested as a young child <laughs> meanwhile if it was lisa frank i would beg for it <laughs> i couldn't stand lisa I was the frank dolphin. as a kid i'm sorry i was the dolphin girl i was the token dolphin girl i can't help it <laughs> Yeah. It was really funny to me in doing research that, like, everybody brings up dolphins with Lisa Frank. I never think of dolphins when it comes to Lisa Frank. Oh, I buddy. always think of, like, cats and tiger cubs and leopards and puppies. I, I never saw dolphin stuff. I have several Lisa Frank dolphin stickers on my DS, on my laptop. I have several Lisa Frank stickers currently to this day, like, mm -hmm. as an adult, that I have fucking Lisa Frank stickers all over my shit. You'd be surprised. I. Mm, we have in many ways become aesthetic opposites of each other where I'm like goth nature kitsch and you are neon pastel kitsch like super bright bold colors I will argue the pastel because yeah. so it's really weird because it's like the things that I enjoy in life 
are goofy and stupid looking, but when I dress, I do mostly wear like either black and mustard yellow Mm -hmm. or it's just bright pink. That's Mm -hmm. it. (laughs) There's no in between. The iconography of you. I love it. I try. I try so hard. I am wearing (laughs) maroon though right now. So yeah. What is your, what does your shirt say? It's a Diet Sig shirt. Diet Sig's a band. Um, I actually bought the sweatshirt the first time I saw Hop Along. So, as Tease told us earlier, Lisa Frank is a brand that is very much defined by its riots of bright, saturated color, glitter, sparkles, and soft, baby-faced animals. They've always got these, like, big goo-goo eyes with big, big black lashes. And so, it was an absolutely explosive band through the brand not band (laughs) (laughs) you imagine a lisa frank band that would actually be kind of cool through the 90s that carried into the early aughts before it dwindled and seemingly imploded in on itself there was apparel stickers jewelry stickers organizers and more stickers there's so many stickers sticker books sticker books sticker 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 books yes Every piece of Lisa Frank stationery, be they notebooks, trapper keepers, or any manner of writing tools, usually featured one of her many characters as a focus. Some of Lisa Frank's characters include Hunter and Forrest, who are a leopard and tiger cub, and they share the names of her two sons. The characters came before her sons, though. (laughs) There's also Casey and Camus, who are golden retrievers, who were designed early on in her career, and they were named after her real-life golden retrievers. Hollywood Bear is a dapper little guy who wears a purple suit lined with leopard print and brandishes a cane. That's it. I want to be Hollywood Bear. (laughs) There's the ballerina bunnies who are named Iris, Lily, and Rose, and they wear these Technicolor tutus and flower crowns. And there's seals and pandas and cats and dolphins. And of course, there's a unicorn named Marky, who is the elder member of Lisa Frank's Fantastic World, and he is named for a late friend of hers. Frank's characters all had distinct personalities and little backstories, and I think it's important to note that they had backstories because things like those backstories and premises are really important in marketing toys to children as they create a basis for play and imagination. And so while some children, like myself, (laughs) may never interact with or know those backstories, there's a portion of that market that is all about those little stories knowing that Max Splash the Whale is a daredevil until he loses his self-confidence, and that Panda Painter doesn't like the color gray. How could he? (laughs) Lisa Frank even has her own fursona in uh, Priscilla the Kitty, who wears jewelry that is fashioned after Lisa's own. She is a fluffy, wealthy white kitten with matching tennis bracelets, tiaras, and an overflowing chalice of all things shiny and sparkly. I hate that as you're saying these, describing these things, I know exactly which characters mm-hmm. you're talking about. This is a disease. <laughs> she's even said before, too, like, she's not a cat person, she's a dog person, but it's kind of funny that her first son is a cat. I'm saying for Sona, I'm ascribing that language to her. I just want to be clear. I, I think Lisa Frank would lose it if she knew about the furry community. So She must. She must. I don't know. I do, we're going to... She's a little detached, as we're going to get into. <sighs> Okay. So the Lisa Frank brand has made over 1 billion in sales since the late 1970s. At its peak in the late 1990s, the brand was pulling in more than 60 million a year in sales. And that's in 90s money. Between 1995 and 2005, Lisa Frank and her husband, James Green, made 100 million in shareholder distributions alone. They were the only two shareholders in the company, by the way. Um, This was an iconic brand that had its own flagship store that you could see featured in an advertisement in 1997 that had a young Mila Kunis in it. (laughs) What the fuck? Yeah. The Lisa Frank brand also utilized a proprietary ink that contributed to the brightness and vibrancy of its illustrations, and anyone that was licensing that ink had to sign a confidentiality agreement about the ink's processing. Yeah, just in like more cool fun facts about the company that I learned is that for a very long time, even while the company started to employ digital artwork and airbrushing, Lisa still insisted herself on doing a lot of the artwork, you know, traditionally with colored pencils, crayons, markers, acrylic paints, um, 
I mean, she she is the one who created this imaging for the company. A lot of people don't mm-hmm. know that Lisa Frank is even a person, much less the identity behind this brand, right? And mm-hmm. in the headquarters, uh, which I don't know if they actually still exist anymore, but in the headquarters... It's in Rhode for, Island, isn't it? No. No? No. It's like Northeast. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but for a long time, in their Tucson, Arizona headquarters, they had a vault... Uh which had every single illustration that they had ever done, as well as a copy of every piece of merchandise that they had ever made. But, like, all the original illustrations are in there. It's really cool. And, like, they still hold their color after so long. Oh, my God. So Anoush Kapoor who? (laughs) Lisa Frank herself is a notoriously private person. She almost never gives interviews, and there are only a small handful of photos of her floating around the internet. Um, to this day, I have it written down a little bit later, but there are only four photos of her online. Four different photos of her online. Oh my god. So, she was born in 1955 in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. Uh, that's either near or outside of Detroit. But it is a city that's frequently ranked as one of the richest in the entire nation. In a very rare 2012 interview that she did with Urban Outfitters, Frank says, Tease, could you read this quote? Yes. My dad was an art collector. My mom had a little kiln in our basement and we would make pottery. I think from about age five on, they sent me to art classes and I was a huge colorer. Huge. I think to keep me quiet, they would bring me the coloring books and crayons, and I would fill up the books. I was totally a girly girl. I was not a jock. When I was 12, my parents got me a loom, so I was a weaver. I love to read. I love to do artwork. I love to do anything girly. Mm -hmm. Her family was very wealthy. Her father actually ran Detroit Aluminum and Brass, which was a family company that was founded by her grandfathers and was publicly traded and you know he was also an art collector she attended the same private school that both Mitt Romney and Selma Blair attended and at an art show she sold her work for over three thousand dollars it's unclear if that was an art school that was run by her school or if it was one she was just happened to be a part of when she was a high schooler but one of the people who bought her artwork was Lee Iacocca you know the former CEO of Chrysler. Oh and $3,000 oh in 70s money, if we account for inflation, is about 20000 US dollars today. Oh my god. <laughs> and the artwork she was doing back then was, again, this same sort of hyper pop, very colorful. I don't want to say kitsch because that feels like it, it cheapens it. But if you've seen Lisa Frank work, which I highly recommend you go look into it um, if you haven't seen it before. But it's it's bright and it is festooned with details and she talks about how even later on in her career people had to stop her because they're like it's it's too much you have to stop because there's jewels there's pearls there's glitz there's glam there's patterns these these images are so jam-packed with details they are a visual feast that you will get sick on Mm -hmm. sometimes in the best way possible she attended the university of arizona And she would then purchase jewelry and pottery from indigenous tribes to bring home to Michigan and sell at a markup, which is how she basically started making money before she started her own company. With time, she even began directing those indigenous artists on what to make, be it bears or unicorns, to bring back and sell. And at the age of 20, she launched a plastic jewelry company called Sticky Fingers, and that jewelry was sold in Neiman Marcus and Bloomingdale's. It's over. I can't do this anymore. <laughs> oh, we're not even at the worst of it yet. Oh my god. Tease, I, I sent you an image of a Sticky Fingers bracelet earlier. Can you describe what that looks like for oh, the listeners? Oh, it was so cute! <laughs> it is a charm bracelet, and it's a golden link bracelet, and there are several teardrop-shaped jewels. Some are transparent, translucent. Some are more opaque, and they're in bright oranges and corals and turquoises. Some of them are like a clear plastic glass. And then alternating between those teardrop shapes are 
plastic animal charms. So a white rabbit, a fat seal, a pink horse, a pink lion, something in the corner that I can't tell what it is, but it kind of looks like another horse or a unicorn. Stuff that is a very clearly in competition or necessarily, I wouldn't say a precursor because I think they kind of came in around the same time, but clearly a competitor to Betsy Johnson. Mm, Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So at the age of 24, the brand was renamed to Lisa Frank. And in that year of 1979, she received her first million dollar order from Spencer's Gifts. Employees of the company later on actually debate the origins of her business where she states that her dad refused to help her, but most people believe there's no way she would have been able to accomplish this without, like, his kind of seed money, essentially. Um, which I think is, you know, more likely. I mean, how does a, how does a high schooler know Lee Iacocca without, yeah. you know, connections? Without papa. Yeah. So the brand ran out of Tucson, Arizona, with an office space that is festooned in bright colors, musical notes, rainbows. There's massive sculptures of unicorns, dogs, and polar bears. It is a absolutely magical space that really embodies the visuals of that sparkling, hyper-pop, colorful Lisa Frank brand. And in 1992, James Green, who was then an in-house illustrator at Lisa Frank Incorporated, was named the president and CEO, and two years later, in 1994, James Green and Lisa Frank get married. From here on out, our story is largely being told and collected from a Jezebel piece written by Tracy Egan Morrissey that was written in 2013 called Inside the Rainbow Gulag, The Technicolor Rise and Fall of Lisa Frank. I will link that article down below. I want to say three-ish years ago on a day when I was working in the office, it was quiet and I asked my coworker, whatever happened to Lisa Frank? And she went, I don't know. And I went down a Google rabbit hole and I found this article and that's where my knowledge of Lisa Frank bloomed into, oh my God, I need to talk about this woman. She's fascinating. So I mentioned before, she's notoriously private. To this day, there are only four pictures of her widely available on the internet. Many people, again, did not even know that she was a real person. A lot of people assumed that the brand's name came from, like, someone coming up with something or it was pulled from a bunch of different aspects. But in that 2012 video interview that she granted to Urban Outfitters, she has herself obscured and only visible as a black silhouette upon a chair. Or, at times, you can see her hands and wrists as she carves through the original artwork from the company. Frank, from the pictures that we have, is a thin woman. She has shoulder-length dark brown hair. It's always styled in this voluminous blowout. She has an oval-shaped face with a strong jaw and a very gently hawked nose. Her eyes are bright and large, and they are accented in each picture of her by the same dark, full lashes she draws onto all of her characters. In speaking with Jezebel, a former employee believed that Frank's reclusive nature was due in part to how, quote, obsessed with her body image she was. And in a 2012 interview with The Daily, Lisa Frank said, In my own little way, I understand Michael Jackson. If I use my credit card, they go, Oh my gosh, there's Lisa Frank who makes the stickers. I go, isn't that the craziest thing that I have the same name? (laughs) <laughs> it's very similar yeah like you don't recognize michael jackson if he was in your mcdonald's drive through like what that's so you're so full of yourself oh my god the facade is ruined <laughs> it gets so much worse i'm so sorry oh, jesus christ in one year sometime between 2010 and 2012 the number of employees at lisa frank incorporated hemorrhaged from 350 to six. Oof. By all rights, Lisa Frank products should have really easily crested the wave of mid-teens purging paper products. Uh, what with the 90s nostalgia that is like ever booming amongst millennial consumers and is being born again now in, in Gen Z consumers. But former employees persisted that the issue with Lisa Frank Incorporated was never the product or the artwork, but rather with Lisa Frank herself as well as her husband. So, from Jezebel, 
uh, again. Tease, would you read this quote for us? Of course. Lisa Frank is notorious in Tucson as the world's shittiest employer, says Caroline, who considered applying for one of the many job openings at the company she saw advertised when she moved to Tucson in 2001, but decided against it after speaking with locals. Every single person I talked to advised me to avoid Lisa Frank at all costs, she said. I didn't know a single person who had not heard horror stories about the work environment there. Yeah, big cringe. Big cringe. Yeah, yeah, glass door, where are you in 2001? <laughs> this was a creative company built around the image of its artwork, but the office was permanently silent and coworkers weren't allowed to talk to one another. Management recorded phone calls in secret and in their bi-monthly company memos offered new restrictions and instructions on staff behavior. This one's a little too real for you, Tease. <laughs> In a March-April 1994 memo, there are instructions for the staffers on how they can interact with their boss, James Green. They list things like, respect the boss's time, don't tread on his turf, follow up quickly, be loyal, keep him informed. It's weird. It's, like, really weird to have a company newsletter telling you how to interact with your own boss <laughs> that's, like, published by him. God, what is... I it was called there, Frankly God. Speaking, by the way. Of course it was. <laughs> of course it was. Oh, my God, of course it was. I wonder if they have a core value sheet. Oh, I'm sure they do, yeah. They must have. Uh, oh it was God. probably just being changed all the time, but visitors... <laughs> weren't allowed it that included family so you couldn't bring any family members into the building and previous mm -hmm. staff reported varying degrees of punishment for any violations including but not limited to verbal abuse name calling and you know just on the spot termination do we know if arizona is a at-will employer state i do not is. know off the top of my I head but it, it probably is, is. it's post it reagan is. so it almost certainly is Oh, it definitely. Yeah, <laughs> this is 1994. <laughs> One time, Mr. President and CEO James Green instructed a warehouse manager to put chains and padlocks on all the downstairs doors of the building so that staff, quote, couldn't escape after he found out that an employee had left the office 10 minutes early. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's oh my bad. God. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's, it's truly a revolving door of employees. So... They just constantly have people coming in and out all the time because they just get fired on the spot. They're Shocker. always running ads in the local newspaper trying to get new employees because they can't keep any of them. Listen, listen, listen. If you're a person who works in corporate and if you find out that people go and disappear after working there for two weeks, you have to fucking run. Run. Take it from Tease. You have to fucking run and leave. <laughs> you have to leave. I promise you, you will find a better job. But leave. <laughs> leave while you can. Oh my god, that's not normal. That's not normal. It's really not normal, and it shouldn't ever oh be acceptable. Uh -uh. Its 320,000 square foot headquarters is plastered with branded decor, including those massive statues of its own characters. Lisa Frank Incorporated, though, dealt with numerous lawsuits from local Tucson contractors for not paying over $4 million worth of work in that space. Oh my God. Even employees who wished to leave struggled to get their severance packages, their final paychecks, their sales commissions. A lot of time they were forced to sue to ever see these, and LFI apparently also made it a nightmare to receive unemployment, which is shocking to probably nobody who is listening to this episode already. Wow. It's People bad. who live outside of America. Really. I feel is... like we are only just now starting to have really serious conversations about work culture and the yeah. demands workplaces place upon their employees. Mm -hmm. I cannot imagine what it was like in the early 2000s, the late 90s, and like even the 70s and 80s because like there's another factor we're going to get into here, which is the involvement of cocaine. Okay. So Tucson was at this point a poisoned well of past employees of the Frank Company's own making. Tease, could you read this quote from the Jezebel article for us? Yes. It was a revolving door, Jacob said, of the company's turnover. In the four years he was employed in the 40-person creative department, he estimates that group 
may have changed over at least two or three times. It was just unbelievable. One year, almost a third of the entire staff turned over. According to Susan Russo, who worked as the sales and marketing manager, over 80 people walked out the door between February 2003 and December 2004, most without notice because they had been treated so poorly. So, while Lisa Frank herself is the subject of many a past trauma that former employees recount, When they were asked what they believed the root of the problem was, they all pointed to her husband, who was the president and CEO, James Green. So what was Lisa Frank's title at this point? If she wasn't CEO, was she like head art director? Was she... It's not clear. VP of something? Or was she just a figurehead? When they got married, she basically handed over all of her shares in the company to him. So I think she gave him like 95% of her shares in the company. Oh my God. And so that is not girl boss of her. (laughs) A lot of her involvement was like being an art director a little bit, doing artwork herself. And I think for the most part being a figurehead, but employees recount how they would hear her on the phone downstairs and their blood would run cold because they could tell she was angry. She would come through. She would just scream at people. She was terrible. And after their marriage in 1994, two years later, after James' appointment to CEO and president, James and Lisa had their first child within that year. And Lisa relinquished day-to-day company handlings to her husband so that she could focus on raising her children. So former employees report that once that happened, she only came into the office maybe once a month to see what was going on. She admitted when she ran into a former employee who she had fired uh, at a salon that she wasn't a very good employee or, uh, employer. Um, but if she was bad, then her husband was even worse and worse still when he ran LFI. It seems to be a sentiment shared by others who've been in Green's employ. In 2005, 16 people who had worked for or with LFI in various capacities submitted swarm affidavits in a lawsuit brought against Green, attesting to his management style. Allegedly prone to fits of rage and loud profanity-laden outbursts in which he would publicly berate people, including his then-wife, Frank, Green was described as abusive, arrogant, and extremely difficult to work with. Several former employees witnessed Green throwing chairs and other objects in the office. Betty Hack, who worked as the general sales manager in Hong Kong in 2005, stated, James' management style is abrasive, and he often leads by intimidation. He is often abusive to some of his employees by his language and actions. He will never take someone to the side if he has an issue with them. Instead, he will scream and curse and belittle them in front of everyone. Whenever he hasn't liked someone or they have crossed him in some way, he makes their work life miserable by his constant abusive comments and harassment. James Green allegedly wouldn't allow employees who worked directly with him to wear high heels, and though he claimed it was because they couldn't keep up with him uh, and didn't walk fast enough, employees actually believed it was because he was short and couldn't stand women being taller than him. Coward shit. (laughs) This is not the behavior of a short king. Fuck off, dude. James worked in pair with the company's vice president at the time, Rhonda Rowlett, who began with the company in 1984, which was just two years after James had started there. Former employees spoke of how Rhonda enforced policy and abuse on behalf of James, and that much like a mountain spring dripping ever downward, James abused Rhonda, who abused the rest of the staff. Employees often overheard James screaming at Rhonda, calling her fat, stupid, and worse. The belief is that much of that anger and irritation, that outright abuse and the frequent paranoia stemmed from alleged drug use by James and Rhonda. Quote, James and Rhonda were pretty big into coke, said a former employee. There would be days when James would come down to the art department super sweaty and super paranoid and just like walking really fast back and forth through the design area. And there was nothing to be stressed about. It was just a regular day. Another former employee shared the story of a co-worker. She told me that James regularly sent her with an unmarked box or a paper bag to meet someone at a gas station or parking lot. She was supposed to exchange her package for theirs and not look inside. There was a lot of rumors and a couple of incidents about their cocaine use so we can guess what was inside. He also had her buy his Viagra and his porn. 
Disgusting. Terrible. And overstep in every possible way. Leave. File a lawsuit. Get out of there. Fuck you. Run. Fuck you, dude. Oh my god. Employees were deeply suspicious and confident that Rhonda and James were engaged in an affair while Lisa was at home uh, caring for her children. Rhonda Rowlett was married too and would later be deposed along with her own husband in the divorce proceedings of Frank and Green. Based on interviews, it seems like Lisa was also the victim of James's outbursts and verbal abuse and had disclosed to a friend she was even frightened of him. She regularly asked employees if they'd stay with the company should she and James divorce. Like, she would just publicly ask them this in the workplace, which is, again, totally inappropriate. Not at 100%. all okay. Yeah. In 2005, Lisa Frank filed for divorce from James Green, citing in part his, quote, close personal bond and secret partnership with Rowlett. But James Green was still very much the CEO of the company, and Lisa had, in their marriage, handed over much of the shares of the company to him. Lisa started post-divorce to increase her presence in the office. She would come in and offer art direction, and then James Green would go over and scream at people for following her direction, claiming it was his company, they needed to do it his way. It was terrible. I cannot imagine trying to work in that environment. It gets incredibly messy very quickly. Tees, could you read for us, please? Of course. James and Rhonda put pressure on people to pick a side. Either you pick Lisa or you pick James, said Kyle. James was telling people if the company splits up, he's going to start his own company. He was trying to recruit people to go with him, so that way, if Lisa did get the company, she wouldn't have anybody to help her. For her part, Frank had virtual spies. Green claimed that Frank hired an outside IT consultant to provide her with direct access to all company emails, which she used to monitor their communications and delete and redirect emails, which she said created a siege-like atmosphere. What? Yep. Fuck a book of... Oh my god. This how is this not like a book or a movie? Because I think she's incredibly private and covetous. Yes. So 100%. It's, it's very she would difficult. never. Yeah. She would never. No, no. But this is documentable as an mm-hmm. actual book, I feel like, with yeah. how much is going on. And it's really unfortunate because I I do in this moment feel bad for lisa Mm -hmm. because i mean obviously like fuck her for marking up indigenous art and i i mean that's also kind of like product of your life experience so if your father's an art collector Mm -hmm. you're gonna learn that from him you know like so that makes sense and like it doesn't excuse it but i i see where the idea came from but here with this the way that she foolishly let go of her company to appease her husband i mean we don't do we there's no we do way to not know, know behind closed yeah, doors yeah we don't know the circumstances by which she gave up those and shares yeah i can imagine she was still a hostile person pre green i yes. mean that sounds terrible yes. obviously 100 percent. but i feel like if it must have not even helped no, <laughs> that green was there not. and probably made it worse and i I mean, there's there's a little bit of sympathy there, but not mm-hmm. a whole lot. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think that's the difficulty, right? And it's like, it's we have it with Lin-Manuel Miranda, we have it with Anne Rice, and it's like, you can look at these people and you can understand their actions and you can understand where they're coming from and empathize with them and at the same point still hold them to account. And I think that's mm-hmm. that's the importance of, like, just being human, you know? Yes, yeah. James had, throughout the history of the company, also been guilty of this same behavior, though, And he frequently bugged both phones and offices. He stole six computers from the offices after Lisa had filed for divorce, claiming that they contained personal correspondence he wanted to protect. She had to file a civil suit to compel him to attend their shareholder meeting, of which they were the only two. And then she had to file a temporary restraining order to keep him away from the LFI headquarters and from harassing employees and sabotaging purchase orders. Because he would come in and he would block purchase orders from being made or he'd cancel them. It was a mess. What the the fuck? Oh my God. You have two parents, right? And you as the employees are all their children and they're fighting over everything. 
it just it gets even worse so the company just continues to devolve further and further and further into this messy terrible legal battle to get ownership this, of the brand this episode hurts me so much because all my job is is, is this <laughs> is purchase orders and fucking shipments and logistics mm -hmm. and invoicing oh my god so can oh you imagine your your you're not she's not even your boss but she is your boss she's my is mommy. also <laughs> she's my work mommy her ex-husband comes in and cancels orders doesn't tell you and things go missing and he's oh. just throwing chairs around and she's also screaming at everybody and meanwhile there's a giant fiberglass polar bear looking very happy in the corner like hi <laughs> Prior to this, the company had been planning everything from clothing lines to a theme park to TV shows. They very boldly considered themselves a competitor to Disney. Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Lisa whoa. has a little bit of an inflated sense about herself. Definitely. James Green sued Lisa Frank and Rhonda Rowlett sued her as well. There are at least nine distinct lawsuits involving Lisa Frank against her former husband and all the tangled, overwrought abuse he'd injected into so much of the company. Bro, their lawyers must be yeah. making so much goddamn money. At the 2013 time of publication of the article we're, we're referencing here, James and Lisa were resorting to court mediation for nearly every disagreement that they had, even going so far as to settle vacation plans for their own children in court and divvying up the possession of family photos. Like, it is it is nitpicky to an extreme degree, and it, it's clearly wow. very petty and vicious and uh, aggressively motivated. In, Imagine they had a jet, by the way. They had a private jet that they owned. <laughs> I mean, a whole ass aircraft mm -hmm. aside, that's miserable. Yeah, those children must not want to talk to either one of them. No, I cannot even begin to imagine. And you named your kids after your OCs. Imagine <laughs> I don't do that. An infant out of the womb and named it Groucho. <laughs> like, <laughs> But it's, yeah, and you just have, like, Groucho artwork that you're selling everywhere, and that is, like, an identification of you. It's just, yeah. Me holding up my picture of Groucho. Me holding up my child. Same hat. Same hat. Oh, my God. In So, you mentioned New England, Northeast area. In 2012, mm -hmm. she cut the company down to, like, six employees, and she attempted a licensing deal with CSS Industries, which was in Delaware, um, mm -hmm. the deal soured really quickly after that company couldn't bring her the royalties they had promised her. So she ended up selling much of the leftover stock of her stationery through Urban Outfitters alongside an exclusive apparel line with the company, but they never renewed after that. I do know mm -hmm. that there was a bit of frustration from Lisa Frank fans about working with Urban Outfitters because Urban Outfitters has pretty limited sizing and also caters to a very young demographic. So if you're an upper age millennial or, you know, you're a boomer who really loved Lisa Frank, that Urban Outfitter stuff really wasn't made for you, you know? No. Urban Outfitters also has a history of a lot of issues. So yeah. I personally refuse to shop at Urban Outfitters just yeah. for longstanding reasons. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just not like I actually do remember when the line was announced. and I was actually really disappointed for the same reasons. Yeah. I, I same. Same. James Green has his own line now that's called James Christian Man. Christian Same. Man is one word. It's apparel, and you can purchase it. The product photos make some filter choices, for sure. Ugly, ugly, ugly. Yeah. Uh, I need to see, I need to see. Editing cast popping in here to say that James Green has apparently entirely rebranded in the year of 2021. He now runs a brand with his son Hunter, as well as Ronda Rowlett called Jamie Green, uh, which he has, you know, in collaboration with those two, and in which he advertises himself as the creator of the famed Lisa Frank brand. So, found that out while I was editing the episode. You're welcome. Back to it. James Christian Man's website slogan is a fool for Christ's sake. <laughs> they have 
a ministry tab and it says in ugly ass letters it's my calling and my cross fuck <laughs> oh this really this isn't an episode about james green but i do kind of want to mention that uh in his entire relationship with lisa and prior he was jewish and it was only after he divorced her that he became christian and there are some oh. former employees who believe that a la eric cartman he became Christian to exploit the marketing behind it. And they don't totally believe it's genuine. I will leave that where it is. I don't know enough about the man. Oh, I'm speechless. Who spends $195 on this ugly ass shirt? <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. So... In early October of 2019, Hotels.com announced a pop-up penthouse in partnership with Lisa Frank, and the reservation sold out in under an hour. The penthouse is, like the Lisa Frank brand, abundant with saturated colors and patterns. There are neon cabinets, many with bold animal print. Those burst off of a background of dark tile. The beds are pressed against walls painted in airbrushed clouds on pink and blue skies with rainbow curtains that tumble down these gorgeous floor to ceiling windows. The bathrooms are papered in Lisa Frank illustrations with shower walls that feature the iconic dolphins of the brand's early stationary days. Visitors to the flat, which was a $200 a night stay in downtown Los Angeles, which kind of sounds like nothing, I'm going to be honest, would receive limited edition slippers, sleep masks, and robes among the heady stocks of candies and stationery. I know I just said $200 doesn't, doesn't sound like much. I'm, I'm thinking about that in the grand world of hotels and marketing schemes. At in this LA. Time. In downtown LA. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's because it's like a single, like it's like a loft and it's pretty small, I think. Mm -hmm. But the flat doesn't actually seem to have sprouted from the mind of Lisa Frank, which is the issue with it. Influencer Amina, I'm not sure if it's Mucciolo or Mucciolo. Um, her own home is what she calls Cloudland, and it was a space that went viral in 2017 in a video titled Home Tour Rainbow Unicorn House. Mukiolo's house is a similar wonderland of color, pattern, and, like, this bright, buoyant energy. The Lisa Frank Instagram account actually followed Mukiolo in 2017 after that video. They commented on her posts about her home. They reposted them to their account, and they even sent her several DMs throughout 2017 and 2018. They had correspondence with her. They knew what she was about. They had seen her house. The Lisa Frank penthouse has the exact same layout as Cloudland. It has the same kitchen table and chairs. It also even cribbed the idea of like the stuffed animals on the kitchen counters. And it's because the Lisa Frank flat is in Mukiolo's sister apartment facility that is literally right across the street. Mukiolo, at the time of publication in 2019, was facing eviction because her apartment company refused to accept her rent. Though it was also later discovered that Mukiolo and her partner had been late with their rent before, and while the rental company assured them this was never an issue, it was always verbal and nothing was ever written out despite Mukiolo's claim that she always attempted to correspond via email, only for management to show up at her uh, door in person. Um, quick diversion, um, if this is happening to you, try not to let it happen. Insist that everything be written down on paper. Don't let your landlord make verbal agreements with you. You need all of that written down and visible in case something like this should ever happen. Tease, could you read for us this Instagram post that Mukiolo made on October 13th, 2019? Yes. I believe I'm being evicted because of the Lisa Frank Hotel. Our landlord refused to accept our rent payment and wanted us out no later than October. We thought it was strange that he was so specific about the time frame, but we fought it. And then, sure enough, in the beginning of October, we learned that the Lisa Frank apartment was in our rental development, owned by the same people trying to evict us. Then we saw that it looked suspiciously similar to our own home, Cloudland, that I designed and shared in 2017. I don't know if Lisa Frank and Hotels.com know 
what is happening, but I know that the similarities to my place aren't just in my head because others have seen them too. They are so similar that many people thought I was responsible for the design of the place. I'm in no way saying it's a room for a room remake, but the inspiration is extremely obvious and the kitchen is a complete ripoff. I was just going to sell my clothes and try to raise money to move, but when the hot this hotel launched and so many of you have reached out noting the similarities, I felt like I couldn't just stay quiet and let this happen to me. I started to feel like they wanted to erase me and my work. This has been really hard. I've been sick and waking up every day in terror, and I almost didn't do it because I was afraid of taking on a billionaire LA developer and these major brands who have inexhaustible resources while I can't even afford to move. And I especially hate the idea of using my platform to put anything else besides positivity in this world. But I owe it to myself to fight, and I owe it to you to be honest. I'm asking for your help because I'm scared and I don't know where else to turn. A lot of you were concerned about where I've been and why I haven't posted and I'm selling all my clothes. And I owe it to you to be honest and tell you that I'm not okay. But I'm also not going to let this happen to my family without doing whatever I can to stop it. But... I hope you take away from this that it's okay to be scared. If you feel like you're being suffocated and you're hiding in the shadows, remember this and know that bullies thrive on our silence. Hotels.com tweeted that same day then in response, uh, adding Studio Mookie, saying, We love that you appreciate colorful design as much as we do, but this flat was curated exclusively with Lisa Frank's iconic signature prints and characters. It was custom built for the two week pop-up room at a short term rental unit owned by one of our partners. We're really sorry to hear of the situation with your landlord, but this is unrelated to hotels.com Lisa Frank flat. We hope you were able to resolve the issue with your landlord soon and wish you the best. Yeah. Gross. In a December 14th, 2019 update, Mukiolo shares that while all she can share at the request of her landlord is that she's moving and is pursuing legal options regarding art theft, plagiarism, and appropriation. I wasn't able to find a further update on legal matters. She did host like a GoFundMe and an Indiegogo, I think, to try and raise money to help her move because moving is fucking expensive. She is a creator, though, whose Instagram and Twitter I will share below so you can check out her work. Especially if you enjoy Lisa Frank stuff, you'll probably enjoy this creator's work, too. <laughs> she does really fun tassel stuff. Yeah. And pinatas. Yeah. yeah. She makes really, really cool stuff. And again, I, I think there's something admirable in wanting to hold Hotels.com and Lisa Frank and her landlord accountable without immediately attacking them. She did call them out last summer, though, because the Lisa mm -hmm. Frank brand came out trying to show solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement, and Mukiola was like, no, 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 you gaslit me publicly online, stole my designs, this isn't okay. Like, this is not your time. Um, and then, as recently as 2020, Lisa Frank has paired with makeup giant Morphe for a collaborative palette, and I found out in, like, the last minutes of researching this episode about another controversy I hadn't even known about, which was that a lot of fans were really pissed off about the announcement of this collaboration because there was a 2017 Kickstarter with Glamour Dolls that they never saw the products of uh the products were made and they were sold in hot topic and through ipsy but they never made it to the thousands of kickstarter backers who even made it possible what yeah the oh, nail company geez. orally has also launched a lisa frank collection it is abundant with nail stickers creme polishes and sparkly glittery top coats and slowly but surely it seems like the lisa frank brand is starting to make a comeback and one that I'm sure with the growing love of, you know, Gen Zers being obsessed with the 90s for whatever reason, might balloon into something much bigger. But I think it's really important that we look at the fact that this company on paper has, from its very origins, been abusive, manipulative, and has taken advantage of smaller creators at every turn, you know? I mean, like... If nothing else, the seed money likely came from Lisa Frank exploiting the work of indigenous creators. Mm -hmm. It's not okay. <laughs> that, like, it, it's not her sole responsibility and fault that her husband was so abusive, but her own actions certainly do contribute to the environment that she helped to create and contribute to in her own company. And, you know, like, I hope she grows. I hope she addresses it. I hope that the future of the Lisa Frank brand can be one that's 
actually supportive of, of smaller creators that listens to its employees that actually helps them rather than attacking them. I just need to sit with this, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Not even from a side of Lisa Frank, but I think from just a work practices experience because Lisa Frank is so beloved and so untouchable for so many people and the abuse of power and to be in experiences similar to that it hurts it yeah. hurts to hear it hurts to hear that other people are going through similar things as you have it I feel it sucks. Like, yeah, that's all I can really I, say. I don't think sucks. that there's, I don't think it's just a coincidence, right? That this brand that is known for its sort of hyper gentle femininity is one that behind the scenes that was so abusive because there's almost a level to it, right? Where it's like, oh, terrible abuse at Lisa Frank. No, that wouldn't happen. The woman just draws cute kitties and puppies for a living. And it's like, no, there's part of that that contributes to a veneer that makes it more difficult for people to come forward and talk about horrible workplace situations like this that are just mm -hmm. totally unacceptable. If your boss ever throws anything in the office and it's not just like, I don't know, at a company softball game where he's pitching something or they rather than like, you need to leave like that needs to be reported. And I think what makes it really frustrating, especially in the United States, is that HR isn't there for the employee. They're there for the company. Mm -hmm. So. Unfortunately, I don't really have any actionable advice that I can offer, um, but, you know, you can do what you can in your own part to contribute to positivity and to help uplift coworkers and stand with them in solidarity when things like this do happen and, you know, speak with your dollar. And so next time you see some Lisa Frank products, consider like, is this something that I want to support or take part in when I'll say it, there's a, there's a lot of artists who have developed a style that is inspired by, but, you know, new and worked off of this sort of Lisa Frank aesthetic that, you know, you can maybe support instead. There's so much cool stationery out there. I believe in you finding it. I love stationery. Yeah. Love it. Big fan of stationery. I still am. This is probably why I am still so into stationery is because I was really into Lisa Frank as a kid. Whoops. This has been Author's Note. Thank you so much for joining us. A, a fun and cool reminder that this episode topic was picked by our patrons. Our patrons get access to exclusive episodes just for them, where Tease and I talk about the things we love or the things we've been keeping up with, as well as like other cool, fun bonus episodes. They also get, you know, to know what episodes we're working on. So if you want to know like what's in the schedule, I think we pretty much have everything that we're doing through through to November is listed up on Easily. Patreon. Yeah. And you also get to vote in polls to help decide what sort of things we'll talk about, which is really fun. And you can mm -hmm. end up with episodes like this. Speak your voice. Let us hear you. You can join our Patreon at Authors Note Pod. And if recurring donations aren't your thing, then uh, we also have a Kofi that's KO-FI. If we do reach $500 a month on Patreon, Tees will do an episode where they tell me point by point the plot of Homestuck. And I'm never, ever going to let them forget that this is a goal that we have set out. To the person who increased their pledge, I'm assuming because of that, thank you. It's incredibly fucking generous. <laughs> Tees is looking wall-eyed into the camera right now. I really, I really agree to that. Yeah. Oh God. Oh God. I'm so excited. So... Author's Note is just made possible by you guys listening, which thank you so much if you're just hanging out here at the end of the episode with us, waiting for that fun little tea spit at the very end. If you oh, want to help support the show and you don't feel like giving money, which is totally valid and okay, you can just listen to it. You can also share us with a friend or with anyone you like, you know, retweeting our little promo things helps us a lot. And you can leave us a review on Apple Podcasts to help more people find the show. Promote us to your friends, guys. That'd be cool. You are our advertisers. Yeah. Uh, literally, word of mouth is probably the best way for a podcast to actually be promoted because God knows if Spotify even tries to re recommend me a podcast, I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> so How dare you? literally just recommend us to your friends i think that's pretty sexy of you if you did love that 
would love that. My name is Cass, and you can find me pretty much everywhere across the internet at Val Hethella. That's V-A-L-H-E-T-H-E-L-L-A. Tease, where can people find more of you at? You can find me on Twitter under Vicunia. That's V-I-C-U-N-A-D. You could also find me writing on Fandom Spotlight, which is... I think fandomspotlight.com. <laughs> if you liked our theme music, that was by James Wyulo. You can find him on Bandcamp under James Y. And Cass, who did our cover art? Our cover art was done by the wonderful and incredible Nyaliest. You can find her. She's Jala. She's my son. On Twitter at Nyaliest. It's N Y A L L I E S T. Tease. Yeah. What's something you think should have a fandom that doesn't? Those videos of people who clean PlayStations. Hell I yeah. Those. I those love are those. so I, satisfying. I feel like I've definitely said this before, but I love those so much. <laughs> <laughs> Until next time, stay safe. Get your vaccine if you haven't already. Stand up for your coworkers. And have a good day. Do something nice for yourself. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.